Hello, I am Cody Allingham and this is the Transformation of Value podcast. Today I talk with Faris Mali. In this episode we talk about Faris's journey growing up in the Middle East and North Africa, working in the academic world in Australia, and his upcoming book, Bitcoin Begins, a beginner's guide to money, currency and Bitcoin. Faris is the co-host of the Bitcoin Basics podcast based out of Nelson, New Zealand and also runs a company providing info about Bitcoin risk mitigation. If you want to get in touch with me, please send an email to hello at thetransformationofvalue.com and I will get back to you. I do hope you enjoyed this episode. If you would like to support the show, please consider streaming some Satoshis via your favorite podcasting 2.0 platform such as Fountain or Breeze. Otherwise, on to the show. There we go, and we are recording, so we're live, but we don't have to um, start talking about Bitcoin straight away, we can introduce <laughs> each other. Um, I just uh, it had a bit, it was actually a beautiful weekend here in Wellington, so I was managing to make the most of the sunshine, but you flew in this morning. No, I flew in Saturday evening. Okay, what, yeah. what have you been up to? Just uh, Not much, just hanging out. I um, Yeah, I live in a smaller town here in New Zealand, and so it's nice to come up to Wellington and um, just enjoy the multiculturalism and the cosmopolitanism. You're talking um, about Nelson. Yeah, I am. Yeah, that's not that small. That's about. I'm from Hastings, which is about the same. <laughs> so, um, I mean, it, it, well, how many cities does New Zealand even have? It's um, there's like two, maybe one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I do like Wellington, as we um, we mentioned on the way up. I lived in Melbourne for quite some time and um, loved. Yeah, the multiculturalism in Melbourne and going in and you just have different pockets of like Little Italy, Greece, Little Lebanon, Chinatown. Um, so Nelson is fantastic for outdoor lifestyle. In the winter, it tends to shut down. No one's around. Um, so it can get pretty quiet. Um, so yeah, when uh, I saw that you were here in Wellington, I'm like, oh, I'll just come up to Wellington. And I was in Auckland a couple of weeks ago as well, meeting up with some crypto Bitcoin, Bitcoin people up there. Jimmy Song was in town. We're catching up with him. Oh, you caught up with Jimmy? Yeah, we've had him on our podcast a couple of times now. Uh, we're actually interviewing him next week. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, it's great catching up with him. He's spent the last nine months traveling the world with his family. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know if you know this, but because I, I met with him in Tokyo a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Um, so we, I, I flew over there for a month or so and caught up with a bunch of Tokyo Bitcoiners in here. I was working on your book, right? Or- yes. So, well, Jimmy was one of the first guys I started following when I got into Bitcoin in 2017. And it was him, Tone Vays, Tour de Meester. Um, Tone, and- Tone Vays is in Tokyo right now as well. So, or he was at least last week. So, yeah. they all seem to be making the pilgrimage. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's top of my list, bucket list to go to is Japan. Um, yeah, there's. Um, yeah, I've not been there yet, but it's at top of my list of places I want to go to. Yeah. Just the, um, uh, just it seems so vast and different. Like you can go from Tokyo to Northern Ireland and the mountains up there, and it's um, yeah, that contrast is, is something I'd like to experience. Yeah, it's uh, pretty, it's pretty full on. Um, but you're 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 uh, working on this podcast from Nelson. Is it Nelson proper or Motueka or uh, Nelson proper? I do move around a fair amount. Um, but no, the, my business partner, he's been based out of Southeast Asia. He's in Australia at the moment. He's about to move as well. Uh, we started the podcast in late 2019. Um, so my business partner comes from, he's good. He's been made of mine for over 25 years now. Um, he comes from a computer science background. And I remember a moment he told me about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And like most people, I kind of had too many things going on to go down that rabbit hole. So he was excited uh, from the blockchain tech perspective. Um, that really wasn't my language, although he's quite fortunate in that or gifted in that he can explain IT and tech to people in simple English. Uh, that's quite a skill that Gordon has. Um, it wasn't until I think 2016 that I came across an interview where someone was talking about the economic and financial aspects of Bitcoin. And that's when I started going deeper down that rabbit hole. Because that's my background is international relations, um, and I've been involved in finance for about 10 years now. So when I started looking at how does Bitcoin potentially affect the financial system, not just the technology, that was the um, yeah the eureka moment for me. And then I remember calling Gordon um, saying, look, I've started looking into Bitcoin. I've had more people asking me about it. I was in a small community at the time. And 
I was spending hours every day just trying to understand Bitcoin. And people came up to me and saying, Ferris, tell me about this Bitcoin stuff. So I was like, you know, the only Bitcoin guy in the village. So I approached Gordon and said, oh, what do you think about a, a business where we help people understand and buy Bitcoin? And he actually said to me, I was about to call you the exact same idea. Uh, so our business plan at the time was we we're going to start weekend workshops, come for a weekend where you know, you know little to nothing about Bitcoin and you can walk away with an understanding of what Bitcoin is, how to buy it securely and manage your private keys and cold storage device. So it's going to be like a two-day workshop where people can come and walk away knowing how to manage their, um, their private keys. Uh, but then COVID happened, so all these workshops that we planned we had to cancel, and this is when we moved into a podcast service. So we still run online workshops, but um, yeah, it's been the Bitcoin Basics podcast is basically where we help people who are 90%, I want to know more about Bitcoin, I want to buy it to that last 10% hurdle. We want to help them get over that to here's how you buy Bitcoin. And we try to explain Bitcoin as simply as possible. What motivates you to try and help other people with this? Um, so I actually come from an educational background. I, um, When I completed my master's at Deakin University, I was asked to stay on and do some teaching. Um, and I remember it was quite handy because I just finished studying and I found, well, what was my frustration with the lecturers and the system at the time? And it was, I felt the, the problem with academia um, and with finance and economics, especially is they use very dense language and it is intimidating. So it can take a long time to understand basic concepts. Um, so I didn't appreciate that that's kind of how the culture works is if you can use two words, use 20. So for me, when I was um, lecturing, tutoring 18, 19 year olds, it was how do I make this as simple as possible? So I, I catered to my frustration um, when I was an undergrad um, and just watching students get that, oh, I get this, that, you know, you just kind of see them wake up in class and go, oh, I get that. That really gave me a buzz. Um, and so with Bitcoin, I mean, I'm not a fast learner. I think I'm a slow but comprehensive learner. So with Bitcoin, it was, what don't you need to know about Bitcoin? Because what we're finding, like I was following all these guys on Twitter and I was going down these rabbit holes. And this was at the time of the, the blockchain wars. It was a lot to take in. And um, like I learned about, I first started taking Bitcoin seriously. It was at 600 US dollars, but I didn't buy in until months later when it was three and a half thousand because I was just terrified of all the stuff I was reading. Like I was hearing Bitcoin's going to break when it forks in the Bitcoin cash, all this stuff. So, and I remember speaking to some people who said, oh, I want to buy Bitcoin, but then two clicks on the internet and it's how to mine Bitcoin. And they kind of just scared them away. So with explaining Bitcoin to people, it's here's what you don't need to know to appreciate Bitcoin. Um, well, what do you not need to know? When it comes to Bitcoin, your first foray into Bitcoin. Um, so for example, mining Bitcoin is one where now we are seeing people go, oh, okay, I want to know how to mine Bitcoin. That's people who've listened to our show for, I'd say, a while now. And they're kind of, you know, they appreciate Bitcoin and they want to get into, they want to understand mining a bit more. Uh, but that was something that scared a lot of people away. There are still people who believe that I can afford to buy Bitcoin. It's, you know, $25,000, I can't afford a, a, a position. They still think they have to buy one. Um, and the fact that we still use Bitcoin um, in our language when we probably should start moving towards using sats or satoshis just to help people understand that you can buy fractions of a Bitcoin. It has eight decimal points. So early on, that was something that we tried to move away from was understanding the mining Bitcoin, understanding um, you know how hashing works, all that kind of stuff. Um, and there's, for people who want to know that, there's heaps of um, podcasts and literature on that. But for us, our niche was the first timers, the noobs. And why is Bitcoin important? Um, you know, it's not used in the dark web solely. It's not used by criminals. So basically, whatever the headlines in mainstream media were, we're like, okay, let's try and narrow down saying, no, this is, you know, a lot of Bitcoin myth busting is what we are doing. Bitcoin myth busting. I like it. So with your, um, your podcast and this kind of educational work, you're trying to explain Bitcoin uh, 
how do you broach it though because i think there's different avenues you can take you can look at it as an investment as a speculation uh, you know as a transformational you know you know a revolution in money and and society there's all these different angles where do you find it easiest to start most of, most of the time with people um yeah, so this was the interesting one. So again, when I first got in, you had you know people like Max Kaiser, who are who's incredibly passionate about this, but can actually turn people off because you find that oh, Bitcoin is for the anarchists, and if I buy Bitcoin, I might end up on some government you know watch somewhere, um, some government list. So that's where we had to be. We wanted to be very neutral, um, not political. Just say no. Here's you know. If you wanted to add this to your portfolio, um, and for us since day one, we've been Bitcoin only, and our position has always been: if you're going to buy it, understand it first, and um, dollar cost averaging. So just buy small amounts at a time, and don't look at the price for several years. So for us, it's been that simple message. Um, there are some people who obviously get in a lot more deeper. Uh, for us, that's where we. That those were our principles is Bitcoin only and just buy small increments at a time and don't look at the price for several years. Yeah, that's pretty easy, I guess, to get started because once you do see that price appreciation, you're going to want to do a bit more research anyway. So it's really trying to get from zero to one, right? And then once you've got a bit of skin in the game, then you're going to necessarily do your own research. So it's sort of breaking down those barriers do you, do you think things have gotten easier since you started the podcast in terms of onboarding people oh my gosh yes so um i mean when we first started a podcast i remember i remember wanting to buy some bitcoin and this was when it was in the run-up between 10 to 20 grand and i had accounts with three exchanges and there was no liquidity i couldn't buy any um, I remember it would take you at least two weeks to get your account set up. Um, this was even with Coinbase. So there were people who wanted to buy Bitcoin, but their account had not been verified yet. And they're watching the price go up and they're thinking, OK, well, I've missed the boat. I'll wait for Bitcoin to come back down. I remember setting someone up who wanted to buy some. She walked into the bank because she had to do a wire transfer. Um, I think this was with Bitstamp in the early days when their bank was somewhere in Eastern Europe. Um, and the bank teller talked her out of it. Mm. Um, so it was really challenging to do. And I mean, we see what's happening with Cash App in the US and now even like uh, the Bendigo Bank, you could buy Bitcoin off their app, but they have now closed that. They're closing that down now. That's what we've seen in Australia. You know, Binance has been cl closing down in Australia. So yeah, onboarding has become a lot more simple. Um, it is good and bad in my opinion, because when we first started, our mission was to educate people. And I'd have people coming up to me saying, well, just buy some for me. Like, well, no, that's not what I'm about. I don't want that responsibility. I actually want you to learn about this. And a lot of people were like, oh, I can't be bothered learning. Just do it for me. Um, we didn't want to do that. We didn't want the responsibility of starting an exchange, of holding people's coins for them. That's just not what we're about. We're, we're both from an educational background. Yeah. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And uh, people do need to have that a little bit of curiosity about it, to um, the intellectual curiosity to explore it and to take... I guess take take ownership of it, um, but I, I guess zooming out. So we've, we've dived in to talk about Bitcoin, but I guess going going back um, a little bit. I mean, Faris, where, where are you originally from? Oh, um, so my dad is Syrian Lebanese, my mum's Australian, and I was born and raised in North Africa. So I was born in first sixteen years of my life were spread across Egypt, Morocco, Tunisia. Uh, so I went to uh, Arabic and French schools until I was sixteen. Um, and then my parents figured I should probably do some schooling in English. Um, and my last two years of high school were in um, Arizona. And then after that, moved to uh, Melbourne, where I did my university studies. Wow. That's uh, an interesting story. So um, you've spent time, uh, I mean, you've got that connection to North Africa, um, the Middle East. How, how have you found that's impacted the way you see the world? Yes, it's quite funny. I mean, I'm quite an introvert. Um, and to be an introvert in the Middle East, most likely you'll end up in an insane asylum. <laughs> it's, really? Yeah. Why is that? It is a very loud place. Um, yeah, a lot of intro if you're if you're an introvert, you do struggle in the Middle East. It's it's just a it's full of life. Let's put it that way. Um, there's there's no real solitude or quietness there. Um, I joke about this with my dad a lot. He's the you know his character personality is a polar opposite to me. He just 
he can't sit in a room on his own. He was like, tell people, come sit with me. It's like, do you want to talk? No, I just need someone in the room with me. <laughs> Whereas, you know, myself and my mother would kind of just need our own time. Um, so for me, it was the, the thing about it, whenever I moved from one country to another, because between the age of 10 to 18, we moved country every two years. Mm -hmm. um, and what do you do? Well, you kind of just observe what are these social norms and protocols. So when you get to a new place, you just kind of just, you know, you're in the background watching how do people behave and then you emulate that behavior to fit in. Um, so I suppose what it's given me is um, uh, I, I can slow down, have a look and absorb new information. So, and I find this is really interesting with Bitcoin is people can have very strong emotive opinions about it. And it makes people very angry because like, I, and it's simply because they don't quite understand it. So it was with me, my life has basically been just slow down, have a look, appreciate culture and appreciate ideas and absorb them. So I think this is just where my, yeah, my mental um, journeys come from is just, I can just take my time and try and absorb something. Yeah. You sort of let it wash over you, right? Yeah. And uh, I think growing up, uh, you know, a little bit different, but I, you know, just had classic Kiwi upbringing. But as I got older, you know, and at university, I traveled a lot more. And so I sort of learned to be in that space that you describe. And so your first night in a new place and you sort of go out and you just observe the way the city exists and the way it, its economy, it's, um, you know, the flow of, of value and tra the transfer of value that's happening, you know, right in front of you on the street. You sort of see what that looks like. And I mean, to be fair, in New Zealand, it's, it's quite muted. You know, you don't really feel um, that sense of commerce. Whereas, you know, Egypt, for example, was even in the ancient times, they were known, the Phoenicians and the Egyptians were known as the masters of commerce, the masters of communication. They were always trading. And so there's this long history. And I mean, in that, you know, area in the Mediterranean, it's like that whole place was built around commerce. And I think that can provide a lot of insight for Bitcoin. And, you know, if you look at the Bronze Age, you look at the history of money and, and all of that. And I, I just wonder whether that, through a bit of osmosis, has, has kind of come through into the way you see Bitcoin, perhaps, like being exposed to the markets and just the way the cities work in that part of the world. Yeah, actually, I've never appreciated that, but I think you're right. Um, so for me, it's funny going around um, the world, like, so I lived in five different countries in North Africa and the Middle East. and. Yeah. The Arabic is different in each country. So when it's just coming to Wellington, I was, you know, got a, um, a taxi in and the cab driver was from Iraq. So we're chatting in Arabic and the usual thing happens. They look at me and go, where are you from? Because it'd be the equivalent of me speaking to someone in English where I'm speaking Scottish, South African, American. That's how I sound because my Arabic is just a melange of all those different countries. Um, I've said this to my kids. I've said two skills you can have that transcend all languages and cultures and that's a cooking if you're a chef and the other if you're an accountant because even though language vocabulary and alphabets are different numbers are the same everywhere you go um, and this to me is where i appreciate bitcoin because that yeah it math and al algebra is truly the world's universal language yeah, yeah, I, I hear. You. I mean, the uh, I was at, I was at the uh, at the NZ Art Show um, the other weekend, um, selling my, some of my photography, and I met a guy from Iraq, and uh, we had a good old chat. That part of the world's always very uh, been very interesting to me, and uh, talking about you know his his village, which was a Christian village, and he's gone back recently, so he grew up in New Zealand, um, and he went back, and it was sort of really strange because he said it was like the first time he really felt like he fit in was actually going to this place that he left when he was three years old and um i something about that really appeals to me though the idea of um you know these these places which are so mediated i think for a lot of us here in the bottom of the pacific you know it seems so far away um but actually going there and and, and feeling that kind of history of humanity you know the um, the basin of, um, but you know, between the Tigris and the Euphrates, is it? Mm -hmm. It's like the the, the, the origins of, of religion, of humanity, all of this stuff. And I, I just think, man, that's so far away from here we are in Wellington. You know, here we are in New Zealand. Like, we're just 
disconnected and we think we know but we don't know and is you know being able to i mean i perhaps add you've got you know accounting and cooking are universal skills but just being able to talk to someone and find out their story and, and kind of hear what they're saying to you uh, i think is another big one which doesn't necessarily transcend language barriers you do need to be able to communicate through that language but it's it's a universal kind of connection and being able to see the world like that and sort of put yourself in someone else's shoes mm. i mean it's it's very powerful oh absolutely and it's, this is actually the only demand i've made of my children is when they finish high school they're supposed to travel it takes at least six months off go off on their own and see the world because uh, I can't remember who said this recently, but a uh, um, so stand-up comedian said, "You need to go to a country where you don't speak the language." Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. And also, um, I think breaking down mental models that you may have been brought up with, or that you assume sort of dogmatically to be true around the way the world works and the way you see the world. I think being able to break those down um, by traveling is really important, mm-hmm. and and more so than ever. You know, I've been thinking a lot lately about the changes that are happening in the world politically economically and i realize you know i'm actually so i have sort of set myself up a little bit for being able to navigate that by having spent time overseas being able to speak different languages myself as well and being able to see things from other people's perspectives and not holding on to the dogma that this is this is the only way it can work and i think one of the challenges you perhaps you could say within uh, bitcoin is that you know there's an overwhelming voice uh, that can often be seen around certain things and um, I, I like falling back on the idea that Bitcoin is for everyone no matter who you are you know no matter what your religion or your diet or your your country or country of origin any of that stuff mm. and and I think it's it's fi- finding a balance between those two because um, it's I mean, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this but like how do you how do you navigate this universal currency, this, this, you know, this mathematical thing, which is, it is truth, right? It's, mm. it's, it's numbers. But how do you navigate that when different cultures are trying to put their lens on it as well? Um, so one thing that really stood out to me, sorry, I'm, I'm probably just, I'll get around to hopefully answering that, but while you're talking about there, a couple of things popped in my head. So uh, when I start, studied my um, postgraduate, I was in aid and development and microfinance and specifically Muhammad Yunus and the Grameen Bank. Um, and he started this in Pakistan. And one of the problems that you have in the world is um, half the world's adult population do not have access to a bank account. Um, so what uh, Muhammad Yunus set up in the 70s was he set up microloans where, and one of the success stories was he provided a $20 loan to someone uh, who bought a, a sewing machine and that guy built that up into setting up one of the largest taxi companies in Indonesia, I think it is, or Pakistan, I can't remember exactly where. Hmm. So the problem is with these villagers, these small people, they have no collateral. So they don't even have, they can't even pay for the bank fees. Yeah. So the way he set this up was um, as a group, you would be each other's collateral and accountability. So, um, you are, if someone falls ill, then four of the other five members of the group would basically come to their rescue and pay for um, for the loan that day. So it was high interest, low um, loans. And um, that was something that stood out. Another one is just the way we run NGOs these days is um, I think a lot of us, will, you know, those that give to aid organizations, um, the 10% or whatever number you do, it is a, a, a method of guilt alleviation. It's like, oh, I've done my bit. I've given it to X NGO and yeah. I don't need to follow up. I'm just going to presume that, hey, they're doing what they're supposed to do. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, 60% of that money never leaves the country when it gets there. It falls under the economy of the trickle down effect and not, not, sorry, not enough of it trickles down to people that need it. Um, whereas with Bitcoin, you know, as I said, half the world's adult population don't have access to a bank account, but there's more mobile phones than people. Mm-hmm. So with a mobile phone, you can directly send funds to someone. The argument against that is that all oh, people are just going to use it to buy drugs and money. There have been some studies say, well, that's not actually the case. Um, so to me, looking at it from an aid and development perspective, this is huge because mm-hmm. you can send $10 to someone on your side of the world. They have a 
you know, could have a Twitter account, they have a phone, and then they can use that to literally change your life. Mm. Um, so to me, this is one avenue that Bitcoin really opens up for. Um, it is interesting to see Bitcoin adoption. Uh, so a fad is something that's introduced from the top. Um, a trend is something that grows from the bottom of groundswell. So Bitcoin is trending in countries of hyperinflation. We've seen this in Venezuela, uh, Lebanon right now. Um, and as you're mentioning before, something that we don't have to worry about in New Zealand, but we're starting to now, is that money in my bank today is going to be there tomorrow. And it'll pretty much be worth the same thing. A lot of countries, that's not the case. Coming back, you, you said your father was Syrian-Lebanese. Mm-hmm. Um, what was... I'm not sure what his experience was like. Have you spoken to him about? Um, I mean, I imagine he's living somewhere else now, or oh, he bounces around. My family's mostly in Australia at the moment, so I, maybe that would have been after some of the financial crises we've seen in uh, in both of those countries or mm-hmm. various strife. Um, does, what did he have any thoughts or any experiences uh, as uh, when he was growing up as a young man, going through different periods of history around money and that sort of thing? No, actually, it's not something that we discuss too much. I mean, he's, uh, and this is a thing, it's generational as well. So um, I think one of my first ever pinned tweets um, was basically about um, Gen X, because I'm, I'm born late 70s, and I grew up with the, the, um, the lesson or the, yeah, what I, my parents saying, go to university, get a good job. And I remember I didn't want to get into debt. I thought, you know, I thought home loans, all that kind of stuff. I wanted to avoid all kinds of debt. I thought I'm just going to work for the next 20 years and then hopefully just, you know, buy a house in cash. Mm-hmm. And I remember sitting down and looking at what the price of property in Melbourne was doing and historically what your wage is doing. And I thought, you know what? The longer we wait, the harder it's going to get. So very quickly went from wanting to have no debt to within a few years owning multiple properties and like near on a million dollars in debt, which, you know, 20 years ago, a million dollars was actually a lot of money. It's not so much these days. Yeah. So that's where I had to change my mindset very quickly going, hang on, if I, my plan of just waiting is not going to work because, and I, in the book that I'm about to release called Bitcoin Begins, the majority of what I'm doing is explaining the gold standard and what happened to finance and economics when we went off the gold standard. And yeah, 1970s, everything changed because cash was worth something. Cash was a method of savings, but it's not anymore. And my parents, their lesson was, oh, just save your money. Well, they're at 18% interest rates back then. You put your money in the bank, you're getting 18%. And there was really not that much inflation. So you could save money. Whereas we can't do that. We have to invest. So that knowledge, that sort of best practice that was inherited uh, no longer applies, Mm-mm. and your your parents and perhaps your grandparents would have been in a, in, a, in a time when the concept of money or value would have been vastly different to what it actually has become today. And so, even though the form of it maybe seems the same on the outside, it's actually fundamentally changed. And we've got these, um, you know, inflation outperforming interest, and so you're losing money; it's melting away in, in, in your bank account every day, which wasn't the case. In, no. in the old days, you could, you know, work hard, and you you said the the story of the taxi driver who went to being, um, what was it, the owner of a a, a major corporation um, through that micro loan mm-hmm. process, um, and that sort of success story uh, is very aspirational because it gives you a pathway. You can see that and think, well, that's something you know I want to do. If you're in that position, um, whereas today it really much it very much feels like no matter what you do, you're not going to make it. Like you, you really need to have some, you know, inheritance or some kind of windfall to even be able to get get ahead. Yeah, and I mean, when I lived in Australia, they had the there was a, the Australian dream, which was a thousand square meter block of land and a house. That's what you're aiming for. And then if you achieve that, the the next leg in that dream was to own um, a holiday home. And I looked at him like, holiday home doesn't make sense to me. Why would you want to spend, you know, $30,000 a year on interest payments for a holiday home that's going to be used eight weeks out of the year? For thirty grand a year, you can go anywhere for holidays. Yeah. So, yeah, it's, I suppose because, as we mentioned before, you know, 
um, I always was a stranger in a strange land. I just have a look at what things are done. It kind of allowed me to question the narrative. Um, and this is why I got, I suppose I eventually got into Bitcoin was I am questioning the narrative of the petrodollar system, the US dollar system, the Bretton Woods institutions that came into um, play after World War II. This was a history that I knew. And I knew that, okay, all currencies eventually come to an end. I mean, Voltaire actually wrote you know, 100 years ago, uh, fiat currencies eventually go to their intrinsic value, which is zero. And we're not living under the Portuguese currency. We're not living under the French one. We're no longer under the UK one. These were the global reserve currencies before the US dollar. Yeah. So the US dollar's days are counting. And to me, it's like this is where Bitcoin does actually have a role as a global currency. Yeah, I was listening to the um, episode with Balaji and Marty Bent um, that came out recently. I don't know if you've I seen that one it. Yet. So it was a bit of a four-hour um, deep dive, and it really made me think about things. Mm. Um, this sort of exploration of really what the collapse of the US dollar might look like, mm. and um, he gives a lot of analogies to the fall of the USSR and how you know. That really was, it was a thing until it wasn't. And one day it just sort of turned off. And it was actually relatively peaceful. It just sort of mm. stopped existing and it decentralized into these independent states. And um, really, when you look at it like that, that's why, you know, coming back to originally what you were talking about with your podcast and the way you teach people, it's like you can talk about it as this this money, that, that this thing, and it's this technology that exists over here. But it, I also see it as so revolutionary and it's like it it's it's a new system it's a new way of thinking a new paradigm and it's like uh, at what point do you introduce someone to the idea that everything they know is actually changing and about to change and continuing to change like it can be quite shocking for people i think yep. you know what i mean yeah you just made me think of yeah plato's allegory of the cave and um and this is that, that problem with the way we are raised to to grow up and to think is it's indoctrinated in us mm. And as soon as someone with a new idea comes across, it can be, whoa, this is just, you know, too much to take on board. Um, so this is why, again, with Bitcoin, it's just what, what do you need to know when you're first getting in and what don't you need to know? It's interesting you mentioned the allegory of the cave because in, in the last episode I did last week, uh, I was talking to um, uh, Devin Lazell and just talking about her experience and how she went through quite a lot of um, life changes and and you know uh, actually near-death experience i guess you could say with um, some medical issues and she shared that with with me and how and and, I, and, I, and we talked about the, the you know the allegory of the cave as seeing the light and then you go back in and you seem like you're the crazy one because your your eyes can't adjust back to the darkness and i often think about that you know we're we're entering into this into this new world and the ones who actually bring the truth almost seem like crazy the crazy ones um, and navigating that, I, I think, is really, I guess, what I'm interested in through philosophy, art, and, and some of those things. And so you've taken a really interesting approach trying to simplify things. And I do want to get into your book in a moment. But th there is this sort of simple language, plain language discussions around the, the thing. But I also think the power of art to actually tell these stories, you know, and I think that's a real open field at the moment. Mm. You know, you talk about Bitcoin art, and I think people think AI generated, you know, B, B logos you know but actually what I think we're looking at is um, quite critical work that explores not even talking about Bitcoin with a B but talking about the world that we live in and the kind of the medium that we're navigating in terms of you know you can look at Gen Z um, you look at in China you, you know the current generation it's sort of this they call it lying flat you know that they're, they're not wanting to work they're not wanting to do, do, do the university thing they're wanting to just chill and have an, an easy life because they've kind of realized that the fiat system is pointless like they're never going to make it no matter how hard they work no matter how hard they try at university that you know the, the chances are they're just going to be slaving away and so there's this kind of i think groundswell of awareness globally especially with younger people that why should i even bother and you could call it doomerism mm. um but actually as an antidote to that so counter counter to that developing work that actually can inspire hope mm. uh, an, an idea for a better way um and I'm, I'm not sure what that looks like just yet i've been thinking about it for my own practice as well but what 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 does artwork and media look like that kind of communicates a different vision for the future and you know who's going to build that and how do we kind of mm. see that come to life 
Well, that's actually something yeah, I've not considered. And yeah, art is incredibly important. Um, yeah, it's our, it's funny, in, in my book, I actually have a whole chapter dedicated to Bitcoin myth busting. One of the problems that um, not millennials or Gen Ys have, but Gen X and baby boomers have with Bitcoin is, oh, it's not real. It's not physical. Um, well, there's cave paintings in Indonesia that are 40,000 years old. Now, to me, Bitcoin's the same thing. It is, it's a story. And I mean, we have, you know, religions that are you know, thousands of years old based on a story. Um, you know, we have England and France were at war for 116 years, simply because they grew up with a story that they were the enemy. They had more in common than any, than, than they had differences, but that's how they grew up. So to me, Bitcoin is a story. And what's incredibly fascinating to me is the time that Bitcoin came out just in the middle of the financial crisis, that we have this alternative um, currency, this alternative system, financial system, as we're going through a financial crisis, which basically was fueled by greed. And yeah, there's... The, the story of Bitcoin it is a fascinating one. And yeah, art to me, that's something I'm going to have to think about because yeah, I do appreciate art. Um, I love French Impressionism. Um, it's because of the nostalgia, I guess. So it will be interesting to see uh, how 100 years from now we look at Bitcoin art. Um, uh, well, so Bitcoin begins, assuming your book. When When's that coming out? Uh, it should be out this week. So i will just where I've, my copy editor has been doing a lot of fantastic work he's, he's done, but uh, just finishing off the cover, but it will be available on um, yeah, Amazon, my website um, this week as, um, as a uh, ebook. Um, and then I'm going to be doing an audiobook version myself. So, yeah. so you're, you're talking about the, the, I guess the story begins, but tell me a little bit more like what, where did this come from? So it, it was quite funny. I, sh- I actually should have done this years ago. I started writing this when I had so many people coming up to me saying, tell me about Bitcoin. And I'm one of these guys who just grows weary of having the same conversation over and over again, I guess. Um, Bitcoin actually seems to be, um, n- that's not the case for Bitcoin. It's one of the things I love talking about. So p- so many people were saying, Ferris, tell me about Bitcoin. I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to write, write a, l- a little something about it. And when people ask me that question, I'll just send it to them. Because how do you explain Bitcoin in five minutes? And that's the thing people go, oh, I just have a cup of coffee, explain Bitcoin to me. It's like, oh, it's not how that works. <laughs> so I actually started writing this in 2017. Um, and at the time I was living in out in the country in Nelson. And I kind of just was very happy living a anonymous life. And I just shared this with a few friends and family. Um, there were very few books about Bitcoin at the time. And most of them were on the, the technological aspect of the blockchain. So in hindsight, I really should have done more with it. Um, but what it is, is it is explaining the time that Bitcoin was created. It is explaining the origins. Um, and it's called a beginner's guide to currency, money, and Bitcoin. And there is a difference between currency and money. So the first quarter of the book, third of the book, is just explaining um, the fiat system, the US dollar system, how things work, because and the gold standard. Because you have to understand that to appreciate Bitcoin. Um, so that, that's why it's called Bitcoin Begins, because it's if you're going to learn about Bitcoin, start here. Because a lot of people are not tech savvy. And this is for those people who kind of want to know the economic aspects of Bitcoin without delving into the technology. So looking at that, um, Bitcoin Begins, you know, 2008, 2009, this sort of quite for the United States and, and New Zealand globally, there was this you know financial crisis that really changed everything. And in a way, I mean, I was quite young at the time, but I do remember it, um, I guess, being mediated to me. I didn't necessarily feel the, the effects of it directly, but I remember thinking, wow, this is, it's, it's like coming through the television. It, perhaps the, exper- the lived experience for people in, in the U.S., you know, maybe would have been a lot more upfront with, um, you know, the housing issues and that. But it really did seem like it came at the right time. And immediately following that, you had the Occupy Wall Street mm. movement and you had this kind of cry for help. But in a way, it seemed like it didn't have anywhere it could go. It was purely a political action and it didn't have anything to back it up. 
Mm. But now it seems because we have Bitcoin, we've got this other place that we can stand from, from which we can observe the system. It, it is this escape path, yeah. this lifeboat, right? Yeah. And yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because, um, yeah, to me, we're talking about art and um, Bitcoin begins, to be honest, I've kind of, I don't know if I should be admitting to this, but I have stolen the name from Batman Begins. I'm a huge fan of the Batman, yeah. Chris Nolan Batman series. Um, and in the, uh, the Dark Knight Rises, there's scenes in there where they're filming, um, for those of you who haven't seen the film, it's Bane, this you know, terrorist who basically rises up and the he creates an army of you know the proletariat that overtake the wealthy new yorkers and they're throwing these wealthy new yorkers out of their apartments and they overtake the city they set up kangaroo courts they were filming this as occupy wall street was happening um and i'm seeing now in film media a decentralization of social rules um and this is actually what I'm writing about next. It's a bit more in depth. It's called the coming age of decentralization. And it's to me how society is going to move away from these rules by government to the sovereign individual, I guess. So, or, yeah. Sovereign communities. Yeah, yeah. sovereign communities. I, I, I'm seeing signs that this is happening. Uh, we're losing our trust in our centralized governments. Um, and to me, when the financial crisis happened, it was at a time where I actually took a year off work and was focusing on a, a, doing a building uh, extension renovation of our home. So I took 13 months off and did that with, with a mate who's a builder. And I was listening to podcasts on what the hell just happened and reading, read several books about it. So I went into a deep dive into the financial crisis. And it was to me, it was like, these guys were just greedy. Great. And, and you're looking stuff at like, for example, you know, um, JP Morgan, Bear Stearns, they're selling these products saying you're going to fail. They created these products that sparked, were, was a catalyst for the financial crisis. When it happened and it all blew up and people lost so much money, the taxpayer bailed them out. You made this mistake. You made a lot of money. We bailed them out. Not only that, taxpayer money paid for the bonuses that they received for products that screwed up the system. And you're looking at this like, this is insidious. And they get away with it because people don't really understand what happens. You get, you know, Yellen and Ben Bernanke and all these guys get up there. They use big language. They're very confident in what they say. And it's a bullying tactic that don't question us. We know what we're doing. Do you think there's uh, analogies that we can learn um, from the classics, but also from, um, you know, the the religions of, of the Middle East. You know, I, I look at, um, you know, say the story of Christ, um, the story of, you know, the Bible, you know, these kind of foundations, I guess, of, of much of the systems we have and, you know, the, the you know, the, the Romans, the, the persecution, these kind mm -hmm. of um, things which in a way we've lost a lot of touch with, I think, especially in New Zealand and a lot of countries, you know, there's this drift away from understanding these stories. Uh, but also the story of the Quran, you know, the different ideas that existed once upon a time and which were very powerful and transformative. And in a way, we're, you could perhaps say that we're living through uh, something, not to that scale, of course, but something in that ballpark where we've witnessed this thing over the last, you know, 13, 14 years. We're writing about it. We're mm -hmm. telling the story of it. And as the story solidifies, it almost sets its own course. It's sort of like a feedback loop. And the more we talk about it, the more we ideate on it, mm. the more we realize how profoundly important this discovery of Bitcoin is. I don't know. Do you have any general thoughts on that? Sort of the. It's what, as you're talking, and something occurred to me earlier where um, I might be going a bit off topic here, but um, I sat down with a couple of my kids and made them watch The Social Dilemma which you know, is talking about social media and how essentially it's designed to narrow your focus, narrow your field of vision and reinforce your own beliefs. And it's created huge divisions in society. Um, so yeah, you're talking about the various religions in the Middle East and you know, during the Crusades, Salah Hedin and King Richard Lionheart actually wrote to each other. They kind of had this um, friendship that was going on behind the scenes. Um, and that's something else you mentioned early on in the interview was um, made me think of um, 
Martin Luther King. So when Martin Luther King went to Chicago, University of Chicago, they're expecting a warm welcome because it was in the north, it wasn't in the south. But the resistance was huge. He's walking through university and you think a university in Northern America, you know, the land of Abraham Lincoln, they'd be pro um, African American, they'd be uh, pro civil rights, but the reception was so hostile. And I, I can't remember where I heard this, but Martin Luther King tells the story of he's being escorted by security, people yelling at him, and um, they're trying to rush him into this building in Chicago University. And he noticed a young girl, young 20s, yelling out, show me that, sorry, N-word king. Where's that N-word king? Oh, no, Lynch king. And Martin Luther King broke away from the security detachment, walked right up to this lady and said, young lady, why is a lovely girl like you using terrible language like that? She put out her hand and said, Dr. King, it's a pleasure to meet you. So it's, to me, that was like, wow, we have these ideas in our head of what something is until we meet that person. And for me, it's this question growing up in the Middle East, you never really heard great things about the state of Israel. You know, half of a lot of uh, Middle Easterns just like to sit down and, you know, complain things on the state of Israel or America. So when I went to university, the first courses I actually signed up for were the Holocaust and the state of Israel. Because I thought, I need to learn about the other side because I've only heard one side. Um, so for me, it's quite sad that we now have literally the world at our fingertips on a mobile phone. But it seems to be designed to reinforce tunnel vision. And like we've seen these days to me, um, you know, we're hearing from our governments. Trust us, we are your only source of truth. Uh, did Socrates die for no reason? You know, this is exactly what we've gone through in society is, you know, like Galileo, Archimedes, Socrates, these people are punished and persecuted for getting us just to question the narrative. Yeah, just to have a, have a conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think that's certainly been something I've been very interested in is, you know, the philosophical side of it. You know, we, we live in this mediated world and, and it's it's just a, a number of things including centralized social media um you know you've seen the the falling away of broadcast kind of government regime media but it's almost been replaced by this this other similarly powerful um you know social media that's you know run by a handful of companies and it's molding people's political beliefs it's molding the knowledge they have access to and it's um in a way, it's the sort of um, Brave New World, THX1138 type situation where you've got the cat videos on the on the TikTok scroll and it's just, you know, the dopamine hit. Mm. And engagement, deeper engagement with civics and, and discourse are, are sort of, I mean, it, it's so weird. Like, who does that anymore? Mm. And, um, I mean, I was very lucky to have been exposed to... Um, you know, f f through various ways, I, I, I got access to knowing that that was a, a way that you could question the world. But I think for a lot of people, that's just not even, it's not even an option. Like it's not seen because they're so narrow in their, in their scope. Mm. Um, and that's like, they don't know that there's this other place that you can stand and, and ask questions from. Mm. And well, I guess part of this, you know, my motives for this podcast, you know, you, you've shared your story uh, with trying to share in, in, in this kind of simple, straight straight language, the story of Bitcoin. For me, it's around uh, discussion and kind of trying to find truth in the so Socratic sort of platonic way, mm -hmm. um, you know, asking questions and, and finding answers and letting the truth lead you wherever it may go and not judging it. And we really struggle with that mm. today, mm. I think, in... Um, in, in in the world, I, I mean, I'm not sure what it's like in um, the Arabic speaking world, for example, but certainly in New Zealand and, and the kind of the Western, you know, even though we're in the Pacific, but like in, in in the English speaking world, it's like we we've almost been aligned to a certain narrative around everything, and as you say, a single source of truth: mm. YouTube, TikTok, Facebook. No, I know of families in America where they no longer get together at Christmas because of who they voted for. And that, that's just incredibly sad. It's like, it's not going to make a difference, honestly, guys. So, uh. Yeah. I mean, I think, do you, I mean, do you see a way 
out of this? Do you see an echo or a reflection of this that may emerge? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I've, I've just gone through the fourth churning book for the oh, third time now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean, we're looking at stuff like central bank digital currencies, the WHO announcing this global ID. Um, and this is what's a bit concerning is they're trying to restrict travel. And to me, that's what really opens your mind and your horizons is, is you need to be able to travel. And they've been trying to, rest- they have restricted that. Um, I'm not worried. Um, <laughs> the central bank digital currencies I see as just failing because, and I use this analogy when explaining Bitcoin, is if you are an amazing computer engineer, scientist, coder, the world is your oyster, where are you going to work? Silicon Valley, no one's going to answer all government department. So unfortunately, government does not attract the best tech people. So as a project, they're going to launch it. It's going to, you know, New Zealand, Australia, they'll lose a half a billion dollars in, in this thing that's just not going to work. Um, so they'll, they'll try it, but I don't see it succeeding. Um, yeah, so we are in, you know, to borrow another Batman line, the night is dark as just before the dawn. Um, so that, that's where we are now, but I'm not pessimistic because I think this is a theory and if governments have, have shown us anything, they love their theories, but putting them into practice is something else. I, I actually do like the Batman analogy that you're running with. Like, you know, it's it's nonviolent. Mm. It's this two feet, you know, a, a foot in the fiat world, a foot in the Bitcoin world, because, um, you know, there's these two sides to Batman. Uh, yeah, the, I, I can see where you're going with that. That's, that's mm. cool. Um, so... I guess coming back to that though, the, you know, the CBDCs, the the travel restrictions, are, I, I think you can see a lot of um, almost these biblical analogies though coming back through with that. You know, it's mm. like you've got the mark, you've got the, um, you know, the Roman guards, you know, at the gates of the city. You've mm. got these kind of images which it's almost like they're wasted on, like the, 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 the power of them is almost like they don't, people don't see just how 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 impactful these these images are Hmm. and uh, i mean as a as a side note to that looking at the new apple headset provision goggle things and just looking at that thinking man this is literally a parody of 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 a sci-fi dystopian future yeah this is you know but but in in sincerity they've built this product and designed it and engineered it without a thought for what it really means mm-hmm. and so there's like design in it it's a designed product it's, it's i guess you could say it's beautiful but it's actually an ugly an extremely ugly product because it's what it stands for you know the place of the head mm-hmm. the, the 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 resting place of of god within you know on the crown to put this thing mm-hmm. over your your eyes and to cover your eyes and to see through the mediated lens i just thought man that's got to be like the most powerful symbol and will there be art and scripture that like looks back on that and says you know this was the world we lived in where they covered their eyes and looked through the screen you, you see where i'm kind of going with that absolutely and i, I can uh, to be honest it really overwhelms me sometimes as an artist i look at that and i feel it like what do i do about this like it's not i'm not imagining these things they are now real and i have to almost shoot back and think well i have to create something else to to respond to that you know yeah, it's quite funny. I like you were talking about Middle East before and, and commerce there. And um, uh, my dad would go to the souk, the markets, and um, spend hours just to buy a couple of items that could have taken 10 minutes. Okay. But it's part of the connection. They, you know, He goes, sits down with people, has tea, coffee, chats. And then years later, um, when we were back somewhere, he's visiting an old friend who ran a, a, I can't remember exactly what he was selling, but it was a stall. And my dad walked in and said, how, how are you going? And the guy said, oh, terrible. Life's terrible. I was like, why? He's like, well, tourists come in. They ask how much is something. I give them a price four or five times what it's worth. They pay and leave. For him, he was making more money than he'd ever made. But there, he wasn't having the human interaction. And to him, life was terrible because he was not having a human interaction. And so what you're talking about now is, and I've I do this myself. Like, you know, I'll put on the noise canceling headphones, but you have to be careful. It's sometimes you want to cancel out noise, but you don't want to cancel out life. Yeah. Yeah. And you, you atomize yourself and you become in a way this 
target. And I, and I think that's one of the criticisms of the sovereign individual is that, you know, no man can do all things and you do need to be part of a community. And um, I think the sovereign community is probably the better way of looking at it where you've got small groups of tightly knit people um, that work together, communicate. And in a way, I, I think, you know, it, I, I do struggle with Wellington, but it, it is a, a relatively tightly knit place. You know, I can walk down the street and see someone I know. I can pop into a shop and, you know, there's friendly faces. Um, it's almost a model for what a small city could be, you know, these kind of pocket cities, which you don't see in in the large metropolis, you know, in, in Tokyo where I just was or, you know, these bigger places, you know, everyone's atomized and so they become vulnerable mm. and they come become easily easily controlled. And, and I often think, well, what does the decentralization of, of cities look like? You know, and we're sort of already seeing that post-COVID, people moving out of places like New York and San Francisco to try and live another life. Um, what does that look like globally? Because arguably cities were the machine that drove civilization historically. Has that machine been innovated upon? I mean, these are all very big, big ideas, but what, what does the future look like? <laughs> Where's my crystal ball? <laughs> Yeah, and this is why, um, like, yeah, I take comfort in reading the fourth turning because we've been through this before. I mean, you yeah. know, globalization was not created in the nineteen nineties. It's been around for a long time. But, um, like, I've just been. If anyone hasn't read the Silk Road, um, it's probably a good ten years old now, but absolutely read that. It's an amazing book. And you know, China used to keep tabs, a database of everyone that came through the country, where they're going, how much money they spent, even I think so. Well, the Mandarins were the record keepers. Mm -hmm. um, that was a class of people in, in China that were known for just keeping track of things. Mm -hmm. um, and you're right, the, the Fourth Turning was a very prescient book. And I think it was like 1997 or something. And they predicted mm -hmm. that the next one would be driven by a disease or a virus, right? <laughs> The, yeah, the, I mean, it's amazing. Like, it, they had zero attention, I think, when the book came out. I think, yeah, it was 94, 97, and um, this was a roaring 90s. Everyone was making money. Soviet Union collapsed. It was an amazing time to be alive. Uh, Francis Fukuyama wrote the, um, what was it, The End of History? The End of History, yeah. yeah. So uh, we actually believed that we ended war, we ended war inter interstate war. This was, we, everyone was on a high, just from a point of international relations, from a point of economics, Everyone was on a high. Um, the good times would never come to an end. It was the 1920s all over again. And um, yeah, and for this book to come out, it basically you know, predict the financial crisis. And I think they even said it was between 2007, 2015, we're going to have this fin uh, crisis, financial crisis and a crisis of identity. Um, so it wasn't until 2008 happened and everything following that, people were like, well, how the hell did these guys do it? No, and we just looked at history. You know, yeah. As Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes. Actually, I don't know if Mark Twain said that, but he's credit, credited with it. Yeah. Oh, well, along, along that note, are you familiar with Mark Fisher? British uh, uh, academic. Is, I don't think so. So he's he's passed away now, but he wrote a lot about capitalism, about sort of that period, the 90s, early 2000s, um, from a very cultural studies perspective, which is generally considered quite a left you know, left-leaning kind of uh, area. Mm. And I was exposed to that, you know, studying um, media and culture at university, which uh, is interesting because it gives me both perspectives because, you know, I'm, I'm also very interested in a lot of the, you know, uh, Ayn Rand, or, you know, mm. uh, Australian economics, that sort of stuff. So I've been able to just expose all of these different ideas and, and see what, 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 I'm, what I'm interested in. But he writes... Uh, you know, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And mm. that idea, which um, he, may, he may take that from, um, I think, Frederick Engels and, and kind of the specter of capitalism, that, you you know, we live in this system that is so encompassing that it's impossible to imagine an alternative way of approaching mm. it. And I think, I mean, what even is capitalism is, is, a, is a question that is... Um, is, is, is challenging because, you know, even Saifedean, you know, says that our idea of, you know, consumerism is actually quite quite different to what capitalism actually is, which mm -hmm. is, you know, being prudent, saving money and buying factories and machines to build stuff. Um, but this, yeah, this, this cycle, the, the fourth turning that, that we're coming into, it, 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 you're right, it's not a new thing. It's happened many times before and we've recovered from it. Mm -hmm. And in a way, there's always a technology that, 
is able to bridge the turnings. And so after the war, it was, you know, a lot of the transistor radios, mm. um, television and radio, these kinds of things. And this time around, you know, is Bitcoin going to be the technology that takes us from, you know, the collapse into the new world, into the new beginning? Possibly. Yeah, and actually in the book, I do explain the network effect of technology uh, to show where Bitcoin is because, you know, so many people go, you know, I could have bought X amount of Bitcoin years ago. Um, it's too late. No, it's not. What, 5% of the world probably owns Bitcoin, if that. So, and when you look at, you know, the S curve of technology adoption, you know, we're looking at 100%. So, very early days. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, Bitcoin begins. You've been working on this uh, book for a while. Um, where does it take us? I mean, obviously, Bitcoin isn't going to end anytime soon, but where does the book end? Is there a conclusion that it gets to? Is there a place that you arrive at with it? Yeah, so it's essentially what it's trying to do is just explain that Bitcoin, uh, what it is, how it came about, but just the basic concepts of it. So what I two things that really appealed to me about Bitcoin was the cap supply of 21 million. So when, and this is against a backdrop where, and I should go, I provide like a spreadsheet of how much money um, governments were printing during the financial crisis. So the financial crisis was created because of just uh, excess of debt. And the response to that was just to create more debt. Now, this is equivalent of say, uh, you, Cody, have a $4,000 credit card that you've maxed out. You go to the bank and you basically say, okay, the bank's going to give you a $6,000 credit card and you pay off the four grand, but now you're six grand in debt. Two months later, they'll give you an eight grand. Now, no bank's going to do that. There's no way they're going to do that to an individual. But this is what governments have been doing, just printing money. And who pays that back? The taxpayer and future generations. And we had Mark Yusko on our podcast and he, he puts, he just does such a good job of putting things in perspective. He says, $1 trillion, just $1 trillion, is a dollar spent every second for 30,000 years. And we're hearing that X billion, X trillion, or just the amount of debt that we're in is insane. It, it doesn't make sense anymore. The numbers are so big. Exactly. And I think um, other, other people have talked about how if you measure it in, in, in human lifespans and mm. you know a, a productive you know, working age person's entire life as a, you know, as a, as a worker, like how many, you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of those are encompassed in, in these numbers. Yeah. And you realize that like how bad that allocation of capital is and how much it's distorting the market. Yeah. So that, that's, that's one other thing I really appreciated was that fact that, okay, Bitcoin is capped in supply. So we're not going to create more than 21 million. Um, and unfortunately between five and 7 million, it's presumed they've been lost. So that was an impetus to our businesses. Don't lose your Bitcoins. Don't lose your private keys. Um, the other thing when I looked at it, it was just, I, I got chills and just blew me away, was the happening. Yeah. Um, and I've explained this to my own kids. Like, if you found a shipwreck of gold and say, you know, it had all this gold, what would happen if you, tr if you tried to sell it all at once? Well, the price of gold would come down because that's excess supply for demand. Um. So, the, and to me, wow, the fact that you're releasing this every two years. So when I started looking at this, I'm like, there's no way one person created Bitcoin because the computer science behind it, the financial and economic minds behind it is fascinating. Um, yeah, there's no way it was created by just one person. Yeah, yeah. Now, the halving is quite, um, quite a powerful um, mechanic as well because it's four years, right, on the... Well, it's every 200,000 blocks. So oh, yeah. on average, yeah, it's every four years. Yeah, yeah. and... Like that mechanic, which I think the big difference with that and I guess what you could say, you know, ideology of, of some, you know, whether it's communism or, or some kind of belief system, the difference is that there is a mathematical reality to that um, mechanism, which whether you like it or not, it's going to happen. Mm. And, you know, we're about a year away from the halvening and then that will bring with it a supply shock. Mm. Um, there's going to be people buying bitcoin every day but there's going to be suddenly half as much of that bitcoin coming onto the market from the miners mm. um and that's definitely going to have an economic impact and we've seen it in the last couple of halvings and so that 
that mechanism, yeah, is quite prescient because, yeah, without that, you know, where would it have gotten its its, its starting point? Yeah. Um, that that leads to the number go up mechanic and, you know, we all know how that goes and people get on board and, and some people drop off when, when the price eventually, you know, comes down from that all-time high, but a lot of people stay on. Yeah. Yeah, and to me, that's what really stood out because, you know, I've studied finance and economics and the law of supply and demand. And I believe it, it is not a theory, it's a law of supply and demand. Yeah. So, yeah, and this is what we've seen during, um, in the last few years. Um, and we were talking before about what COVID did, um, the government lockdowns. So I saw a couple of um, headlines. One was the middle class during government lockdowns lost one and a half trillion dollars. Billionaires gained one and a half trillion dollars. Yeah. And because we printed so much money, it's made the value of said money worth nothing so people will basically go out if you can you'll borrow money cheaply what will you do you'll buy real estate real estate's gone through the roof um people are we're finding that people were running out or we were running out of antique watches because people were investing in them yeah people investing in someone else's handbag so this was actually a case where you would invest in a hermes someone buy a twenty thousand dollar hermes bag and you would send them money and you own part of that handbag because you expected that to appreciate in value. Yeah. Because we made cash, inverted commas, so cheap, you weren't going to sit on it. And stuff like what Tim Cook has done with Apple where he's just, you know, they buy their own shares, share price goes up. Uh, oh, the Swiss National Bank, they have bought so many shares in Apple and other companies. Now, for them to do that, what do they do? You know, control P, create Swiss francs, <laughs> Send them to America, buy shares in Apple, yeah. price goes up. Well, what happens if you want to buy shares in Apple? Well, you need to get a job, you need to pay your taxes, pay your bills. What money left you have left over, then you can buy shares in Apple. Yeah, and you're spending your, yeah. your time on earth. You're working to make that money. Exactly. With them, they've just created money out of thin air, bought shares in Apple, made the price go up, made it more difficult for everyone else to be involved. Oh, this Zimbabwe. I have not got one of these yet. Sorry, you've just handed me a $500 million Zimbabwe. So my friend, Fantastic. my friend from Zimbabwe gave that to me. Yeah. He uh, immigrated to New Zealand when he was fifteen, and he always tells me how, uh, towards the end, or you know, they would run yeah. through the supermarkets to get the food before a new price stickers. Yeah, uh, sorry, the, the capital Harare, I think it is. Um, the, the the run through the supermarket to get the food before this new price stickers went yeah. on, and um, I mean it's it's the classic story, and this was around about the same time, right? Yeah. Um, 2000, was it Robert, Robert Mugabe? Mugabe, two, yeah. 2008, something like that. Well, uh, we're talking about, yeah, sorry. Oh, no, and um, there was the idea, you know, this, when you've got an ab uh, abundance in money, mm. you've got scarcity in goods, and yep. scarcity in money, you give an abundance in good, goods. Well, I remember this is going back almost 20 years now, where um, if no one's heard of the beers, they're the monopoly for the, the, the diamonds. diamonds yeah. yeah, so Charles Taylor, president of Liberia, um, had diamonds in the country and he didn't like the offer that the beers were giving him. So he decided, I'm just going to go bypass the beers and sell my diamonds on the open market. Now, the beers have a stack of diamonds that they just leave in a warehouse. What did the beers do? They flooded the market with diamonds, brought the price down, forced Charles Taylor to take their offer. Supply and demand. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, um, yeah that's, that's fascinating. I think, I mean, we've touched on many things. Um, it's it's hard though because you, you, the goal of of your your podcast is to kind of boil these things down. But as we've discussed, there's so much to it. It's um it doesn't. I think the way I see it, it doesn't exist within our current system. Like you cannot you cannot understand it through the lens and the mechanics of our current worldview. It is a entirely new way of looking at things. You know, if you were to take your computer back to ancient Greece and show them it, they'd be like, we, we, you know, they'd look at it like a window. Like, where, where's the thing on the other side? That's, you know, but we, we've grown up with it. We understand that there's this abstraction of my file system of, of the, the pixels on my screen represent data and information. Something like that, that transformation, even the written word, you know, something of that magnitude is happening right now with the way we see value. And that's, you know, why my show, I call it the transformation of value, the way we we do everything it is changing and i think having these conversations is really important to almost document the process of going through this like 
because we'll come i think we will look back on it one day and be like it it, it all happened and then it all makes sense now but while we're in it mm. and while we're setting the course and we're on 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 the journey it's it's really hard to necessarily see where it's going i think we can feel where it's going we've got a general sense that the wind's blowing in our in our hair and we can feel that we're heading in a direction but it, it can be quite freaky i think to really entertain it and so we've also got this reaction where people want to cling on to what was mm. which is like of, of all the things i can I, I'm, I'm pretty sure are not going to happen where we are not going to stay the way things were oh absolutely we, we are at the very beginnings of a new hundred year cycle and if you go back a hundred years say think of what happened between 1920 to today that that hundred years uh we had the creation of the middle class um which was huge um we had we opened up the world for anyone to travel you know 100 years ago if you want to go from one place to another it'd take you months um so much happened in the previous 100 years um we ended empires you know we still had the austro-hungarian empire the ottoman empire all these came to an end and we oh, we had democracy come about so we are now at the next 100 year cycle yeah. the very beginnings of it yeah bitcoin begins mm. Well, um, I really appreciate your time, Ferris. Um, if, if people want to, you know, listen to your podcast, want to connect with you, follow your story, um, where, where can they go? Where do you want to send them? Uh, BitcoinBasics.help and my own website, FerrisMolly.com. Okay. And I'll put details for the, the book and, 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 and these you know, links to things we've discussed as well and, into the show notes. But um, thank you very much for coming into the studio today and, and sharing um sharing what you're working on um, I, I do look forward to uh, actually having a look through your book as well and I guess learning a bit more about where it's come from and where it's going oh thank you Cody yeah. it's been a, been a real pleasure no, I appreciate it thank you